Hi, this is Asaf Mogadam. Uh, I'm a senior lecturer at the Interdisciplinary Center Herzliya and uh, researcher at the ICT. And I'm um, very sorry that I couldn't attend the conference, but I wanted to thank uh, the organizers and especially uh, Gordon, uh, Gordon for giving me a chance to uh, do this uh, video recording. This is the first time that I'm doing a video conference, so I'm uh, very excited. I hope it's going to go well. And uh, I should uh, see you in about half an hour for the Q&A. So uh, enjoy. Thank you. This presentation looks at how Al-Qaeda innovates, which is a topic I've been interested in uh, for the last couple of years. Uh, the focus here is on the directions of innovation, and uh, it's actually a case study of the September 11 attacks. But I'm also going to make some. Uh, I'm also going to talk about some uh, of the implications of this research for innovation, uh, the question of innovation and terrorism uh, in general, beyond Al Qaeda. But before we get to the uh, heart of the matter, why does uh, terrorist innovation even matter? Why should we care about terrorist innovation? Well, if we look at uh, some of the most innovative terrorist attacks throughout history, starting with the 19, perhaps with the 1970 multiple airliner, multiple airline hijackings, uh, and their subsequent de detonation in uh, Dawson's uh, field in Jordan, uh, or afterwards, uh, for example, the Munich attacks in 1972, of course, Am Shinrikyo's 1995 uh, sarin nerf gas attacks, the September 11 attacks, of course. What many of these uh, innovative, highly innovative attacks have in common is, of course, not only their spectacular novelty, but also the fact that uh, they were very, very consequential in terms of uh, the cost, the human, uh, the cost in, uh, in human lives, uh, material damage, uh, they were uh, also highly demoralizing to their enemies. The enemies, they posed essentially a strategic surprise to their enemies. Uh, the enemies were caught uh, off guard, and um, this uh, humiliation of the enemy uh, at times led to a conflagration, uh, a long-term conflict between the targeted states and the uh, attacking terrorist organization. And so innovative terrorist attacks, as a result, have uh, a tendency to lead to, uh, to long-term conflict, and sometimes with, uh, de with a devastating impact on international affairs in general. And we can see this, of course, um, most clearly in the case of the 9-11 attacks. Terrorist innovation, uh, innovative terrorist attacks also have a tendency to spur copycat attacks because of their spectacular novelty uh, terrorist organizations oftentimes are trying to emulate those organizations or those tactics that have caused uh, such uh, significant uh, damage while at the same time stra uh, sending a very, very strong message uh, to their enemies. The uh, should, of course, should uh, CBRN weapons be used in future attacks as they were in, uh, in uh, Tokyo by Aum Shinrikyo, that, of course, also would be a uh, significant uh, innovation, uh, most likely. And so uh, CBRN attacks also uh, suggest that we should pay a lot of attention to terrorist, uh, to, to terrorist innovation, to innovative terrorist groups, and to innovative terrorist uh, tactics. Another reason that this matters is because Al-Qaeda and the global jihad movement in general, but specifically Al-Qaeda, the organization, which is uh, the topic of uh, the main topic for of, of this presentation, Al-Qaeda is oftentimes mentioned as a group that is highly innovative or nimble. It's oftentimes described as, as nimble, agile, or, or adaptive. And so because um, Al-Qaeda continues to pose uh, a significant threat to Western nations, including the United States, uh, the focus on innovation, especially uh, with regard to Al-Qaeda, is, uh, is also important. Uh, just to give you uh, another example, uh, a few years ago in the journal uh, Perspectives on Terrorism, uh, Leonard Weinberg, the uh, eminent uh, terrorist uh, historian, historian uh, on terrorism, I should say, uh, Leonard uh, suggested that he highlighted only two topics that are understudied uh, in terrorism. Certainly there are more, but he highlighted two, and one of them was terrorist innovation. And uh, as Weinberg uh, said, uh, counterterrorism efforts should focus specifically on the most uh, innovative uh, terrorist organizations. So um, before we get into the gist of this uh, research, uh, a quick uh, discussion of definitions. How are, terrorists, how are acts of terrorist innovation actually uh, defined in the literature? Well, first of all, I should argue and um, state, and, and this is no news to, uh, to this uh, crowd, that the uh, scholarship on terrorist innovation is, of course, uh, 
quite underdeveloped, uh, to put it uh, mildly. Uh, there are only, uh, you can count the number of uh, scholarly books on the topic in, uh, on one hand. Uh, Adam Dolnik's book is uh, the, the most uh, important book, and the only really scholarly book on the, on the topic to date. Uh, Dolnik defines terrace innovation quite narrowly as the uh, introduction of a new method or technology uh, or the improvement of an already existing capability. Uh, he also says that the, uh, the use of preparations to use a tactic and a technology that had not been adopted by any group, by any terrorist group prior to that moment uh, is an example of a terrorist innovation. So in other words, terrorist innovation uh, are basically uh, tactics, modus operandi uh, techniques, which have not been used uh, before. Martha Crenshaw generally agrees that terrorist innovation can, be, uh, can take tactical forms or can take uh, technological forms, but she distinguishes between uh, different types of innovation. For her, tactical or technological innovation is just one possible form of innovation. The other forms, uh, the other possible forms being strategic innovation or uh, organizational innovation. So, uh, for example, the uh, advent of the internet would be a form of uh, innovation or um, uh, suicide terrorism, uh, airline hijackings uh, would certainly be for her forms of innovation. Uh, Crenshaw, for Crenshaw, innovation is essentially a form of, uh, of problem solving. How terrorist organizations solve uh, problems posed by uh, counterterrorism defenses. Uh, in my research, I'm going to uh, stick to the more uh, narrow definition, the, the tactical or technological uh, definition, uh, because it's a definition that is accepted by both uh, Dolnik and Crenshaw, and because it, it fits my uh, my purposes. Before I get to the question of uh, that interests me most in my research, uh, which is who drives innovation, uh, just a brief review of existing scholarship on what actually drives innovation. What are the factors? Uh, that some terrorism scholars have suggested are driving innovation. So ideology is mentioned as one possible factor. Ideology, uh, we know this from uh, existing studies, has driven target selection in a number of cases. So some uh, scholars have argued that ideology can actually lead organizations to innovate uh, because of their desire, for example, to achieve certain strategic objectives or to strike at certain enemies. A second factor which is oftentimes mentioned as a, as a key driver of innovation are rivalries uh, or competition between different groups. Uh, for example, uh, rivalries or competition have been uh, argued to lead to the adoption of suicide attacks um, or of airline hijackings. Rivalries and competition may not explain uh, innovation, why groups innovate in the first place, but they can certainly, I believe, explain some cases in which uh, there have been some uh, early adoptions or, or late adoptions of uh, certain terrorist innovations. Uh, the availability of new resources or personnel has also been mentioned uh, as, a, as a possible driver of innovation. Uh, examples would include uh, dynamite, of course, the invention of dynamite or PTN, uh, or uh, even satellite TV, right, uh, in the case of the Munich uh, uh, Olympic uh, massacre. Um, uh, and then there's also uh, a fascination with the weapon or technology, which some have argued uh, can uh, influence the decision to uh, adopt an innovation. Uh, this would, uh, a good example here would be perhaps Shoko Azahara's uh, obsession with uh, chemical and biological weapons, which was a, a very, very important reason why uh, Aum Shinrikyo started to develop this capability. But the question I'm more concerned with is who drives innovation? So if uh, the, the previous question, what drives innovation, has received some attention, the question of who actually drives innovation, where does innovation stem from, where does it originate, uh, has received even uh, less uh, attention. And here there are, uh, at least in the terrorism literature, there is a, a conventional wisdom that innovation in terrorist organization is mainly driven from the top down, that it's mainly driven by senior leaders or by subordinate groups, uh, I'm sorry, by senior leaders and not by uh, subordinate members uh, of the organization. Uh, examples would include in the literature uh, the role played by people like uh, Ahmed Jibril, for example, uh, of the PFLP, GC, uh, and, and his uh, key influence in the adoption of uh, such innovative tactics as the advent of barometric pressure devices to detonate aircraft or hang gliders. Uh, 
another example would be Carlos Marighella's role, uh, key role really, in uh, devising a strategy of diplomatic uh, attacks against uh, diplomats or diplomatic uh, hijackings. Uh, Om Shinrikyo, uh, the key role played by uh, Shoko Azahara in developing the CBRN uh, weapons. Uh, Menachem Begin's very, very influential role in developing the, cla the Glasshouse strategy for the Ilgun. So most of the terrorism literature, in other words, is, uh, is replete with cases of, uh, or, or with discussions of uh, the central role played by senior leaders of terrorist organizations in either devising innovation or in pushing the process of innovation down to uh, 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 the lower ranking elements of the organization. There is very little discussion of the role that subordinate groups, that mid or lower ranking members of the organization play in the innovation process. And what's really interesting is that uh, this is a striking difference to existing research in, uh, among strategic scholars and international security scholars when it comes to military innovation studies. So when it comes to military innovation studies as opposed to terrorist innovation studies, there has been uh, for quite some time a realization on the part of scholars that there is both top-down as well as bottom-up innovation. As a matter of fact, recently uh, with the uh, coin campaigns, uh, counterinsurgency campaigns raging in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, there have actually been uh, a lot of uh, indications that bottom-up innovation plays a very, very important role. Um, so uh, I was interested in actually testing this question. So I, I so if most terrorist innovation scholars uh, assume that innovation is mostly driven from the top, then I was really interested uh, in, in finding out whether this actually uh, is really the case. And so my research then examines a case study of uh, terrorist innovation, namely the 9-11 namely the attacks, for evidence of uh, top-down versus bottom-up innovation. Uh, I was really interested in uh, where innovation originated in the planning for the 9-11 attacks. Uh, now, why did I choose the 9-11 attacks? Well, because the 9-11 attacks, first of all, are to me at least uh, a clear case of terrorist innovation, but also because this type of, of inquiry uh, requires a lot of information. And of course, the 9-11 report in itself is a, is a treasure trove of information, uh, perhaps the single most uh, researched, uh, written about terrorist attack uh, in history. And so uh, the 9-11 attacks was very conducive to a study, a single case study uh, uh, of this type. But before I get into the uh, discussion of the extent to which the 9-11 attacks featured either top-down or bottom-up or both uh, types of innovation and perhaps other types of innovation, uh, I think it's uh, in order to talk about what is actually innovative about the 9-11 attacks. So I argue that what's innovative about the 9-11 attacks, there are many innovative uh, issues, but uh, what I argue is uh, perhaps most innovative is that the 9-11 attacks have been the first successfully executed uh, terrorist attacks in which multiple airliners were hijacked and subsequently crashed onto targets. Now, uh, this does not mean that airliners have never been hijacked before or that they, they were never crashed onto targets before. Uh, but actually, uh, and there were, of course, multiple airline hijackings before. Um, now, airliners have been uh, hijacked and uh, or have been flown into the grounds uh, before. In 1976, a Japanese man crashed his uh, Piper Cherokee onto the home of a Japanese uh, businessman. Uh, in 1994, uh, uh, insane, insane uh, man, uh, Frank Eugene Corder, uh, flew his uh, Cessna into the south lawn of the White House. But these were not acts of terrorism. They were not politically motivated. Uh, when it comes to multiple airliners, uh, there were cases of multiple airline hijackings, such as the uh, 1970 uh, Dawson's Field incident, but these were not crashed onto targets on the ground. Uh, they were landed uh, and then subsequently blown up. So the 9-11 attacks in that regard are really the first successfully executed uh, attack in which multiple airliners were uh, crashed onto targets uh, in the ground. Perhaps the idea had been entertained before, but this was the best, the, the, uh, the first implementation. So, uh, so I took uh, the 9-11 uh, uh, attacks and I examined them for evidence of uh, top-down innovation and bottom-up innovation. And so when it comes to top-down innovation, uh, there are a number of indicators that uh, top-down 
uh, factors played a, a very, very important role, a critical role, really, in the innovation of uh, terrorist uh, of the 9/11 attacks. Uh, in terms of these goals, it's first of all, Al Qaeda's organizational goals, uh, and specifically Al Qaeda's uh, focus, obsessive focus on targeting the United States. Uh, I argue has uh, impelled the group to seek ways to attack it. Uh, it's of course not easy to strike a superpower, and it really required an attack of uh, innovative proportions to uh, succeed in striking the, uh, the, uh, the hated uh, U.S. enemy. More importantly, perhaps, uh, in terms of uh, top-down factors, are Bin Laden's uh, perhaps unique leadership skills, which were really uh, uh, crucial for the attack to succeed. First of all, Al Bin Laden was a person who was known to be able to make very, very difficult decisions, uh, as any uh, good leader uh, does. Uh, the authors of the 9-11 attacks were struck by the remarkable speed, for example, by which he, uh, by which he uh, selected the hijackers of the 9-11 attacks. Uh, he also was responsible for uh, selecting all the muscle hijackers for the attacks. Um, a second point which indicates his uh, leadership skills which were uh, so important for the 9-11 attacks to succeed was his pragmatism. And what I mean here is that Bin Laden basically uh, received a proposal, of course, of the 9-11 attacks by Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, uh, but he took that proposal, which was rather megalomaniacal initially, and he turned it into a, a much, much more feasible uh, plan. Initially, the uh, idea by uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, or KSM, as he's uh, known, uh, was to hijack as many as 10 airliners, uh, crash them onto various targets into the ground, both on the East Coast and the West Coast of the United States, uh, and then to, uh, to make a statement uh, on a tarmac uh, at the end. But Bin Laden took this uh, ambitious plan of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and, uh, and turned it into something that was much, much more uh, feasible. Of course, still ambitious, but more feasible than the initial plan. So he was a pragmatist. Uh, he was, in addition, another uh, leadership skill that was very conducive to the innovation, for the innovation to succeed, was, was Bin Laden's tenacious pursuit of this goal. Uh, and why, ten why tenacious? Well, because there was a lot of resistance against Bin Laden to go ahead with the 9-11 attacks, including on the part of uh, those who provided him with a safe haven in Afghanistan. Mullah Omar, the leader of the Taliban, was known to, uh, to really resist, uh, to, to, to try to convince Bin Laden not to go ahead with the 9-11 attacks. There was also a lot of resistance within uh, other members of Al-Qaeda senior leadership against the attack, including by the military commander, Saif al Uh There was a fear that the attacks are going to uh, boomerang, that they're going to backfire, and that they're going to provoke the United States into uh, retaliation against Bin Laden. And this is actually what turned out to be the case. But Bin Laden uh, went ahead anyway. He insisted on going ahead uh, with a strike. And so we can uh, assess that without Bin Laden's uh, leadership skills, without his leadership, there would probably never have been 9-11, uh, uh, an uh, and there would not have been this uh, tremendous example of terrorist innovation. Uh, there is also uh, Al-Qaeda's obsession with, mod with uh, suicide attacks, or as they call them, uh, martyrdom uh, operations, was also uh, something that was uh, another factor driven from the top. Um, Al-Qaeda has, uh, for quite some time before 9-11, had this, what I call this martyrdom complex. It had a symbiotic relationship with self-sacrifice. And so, of course, if we look at the most, uh, the most famous and the most consequential terrorist attacks by uh, uh, Al-Qaeda before 9-11, uh, they were all, uh, or most of them, uh, suicide attacks, including, of course, the uh, embassy bombings in 1998 in Kenya and Tanzania, the attack against the uh, USS Cole, or also the attack against uh, Ahmed Shah Massoud uh, two days before 9-11. So uh, Al-Qaeda has uh, uh, pursued and adopted uh, suicide terrorism uh, for, a com for a combination of reasons, uh, for a combination of religious ideological uh, doctrinal goals as well as for uh, pragmatic reasons. And finally, another factor which we can group in the uh, top-down drivers of innovation is Al-Qaeda's uh, obsession with attacks against airliners. Al-Qaeda has always been obsessed with airliners. 
It has continued to be obsessed with these attacks uh, even after 9-11 uh, as the 2006 uh, attempt to uh, detonate uh, airliners with liquid explosives has suggested. And uh, this obsession with the airliners has even extended to Al-Qaeda's affiliates, as we know, for example, from the attempt by Abdul Muttalib to detonate himself in an airliner. So there is ample example of factors uh, which we can group under the category of top-down innovation. What about the role of bottom-up factors in the, uh, the run-up to the 9-11 attacks? And here there are a number of uh, very, very interesting uh, items which, can, which, which we could potentially uh, uh, conceive as being bottom-up drivers of innovation. The first is the fact that Al-Qaeda uh, bin Laden specifically was highly receptive to proposals for terrorist uh, attacks, kind of like a venture capitalist. He was encouraging uh, out-of-the-box thinking and he was willing to fund, to accept and to fund the best uh, proposals. And this ability to, this openness to proposals for, for terrorist attacks is what attracted uh, independent terrorist entrepreneurs like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed to come up with uh, innovative proposals, uh, suggest them to Al-Qaeda, uh, and the best of these proposals were usually accepted, as was uh, KSM's idea for uh, planes operation. Uh, I will discuss exactly whether we're, we can speak uh, in the case of the receptivity to proposals whether that really amounts to uh, an example of bottom-up innovation. Uh, I will speak about that uh, in a few minutes. An additional organizational characteristic that allowed for the inclusion of what at first glance might be uh, bottom-up factors was Al-Qaeda's uh, management philosophy when it came to planning and executing terrorist attacks, which uh, was described as centralization of decision, decentralization of execution. What this management philosophy involved was really uh, that bin Laden basically was responsible for, for setting uh, the, the main targets, uh, perhaps selecting some of the leaders and funding at least part of the operation, but providing a lot of latitude when it comes to uh, the execution of the, uh, the fine-tuning and the planning of the actual uh, attack. So in the case of the 9-11 uh, attacks, uh, bin Laden tried to influence the target selection uh, he funded the operation and he had a role in selecting the lead hijackers and the muscle hijackers, but the actual planning of the attack was conducted by, uh, by Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and then with important with uh, Mohammed Atta, the lead hijacker, serving as the uh, tactical commander. The importance of this uh, management philosophy of centralization of decision, decentralization of execution, is the fact that there is a lot of leeway, that the operational and tactical commanders of the terrorist attacks have a lot of leeway uh, in carrying out the operation and uh, in the course of the planning al also uh, at times come up with, uh, with uh, innovative uh, steps to overcome, especially to overcome some, uh, some hurdles. Perhaps the most, uh, the, the, the clearest example of bottom-up innovation in the run-up to the 9-11 attacks is uh, what I would uh, call trial and error, is the fact that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed together with his nephew Ramzi Youssef, uh, the planner, the perpetrator of the first World Trade Center bombing in 1993, that they together had worked on uh, various schemes to target uh, airplanes and to crash, to, to, de to detonate airplanes uh, over the skies or to target them, uh, to crash them onto the ground. And so uh, eventually this was a proposal, this was a, this was a plot that was accepted uh, by bin Laden, but it was a plot that was uh, that was planned and uh, tried out for a long time before, uh, under the name of uh, the, B the, Bujinka, uh, the Bujinka plot. And so uh, this, what I call trial and error, which involved actually also a physical uh, attack against an airliner in which a Japanese uh, man died in the process, uh, this probably resembles most clearly uh, an example of bottom-up innovation. Uh, very similar to the way that bottom-up innovations are usually described also among military scholars, namely uh, examples of, um, of battlefield operations in which units are trying to overcome uh, problems. Uh, and, uh, and, and so this, I believe, is the most uh, the clearest example. So what can, we, what can we conclude when it comes to the role that innovation and the drivers uh, the, the directions of innovation uh, 
uh, and the planning of the 9-11 attacks. So uh, when it comes to top-down drivers of innovation, I think that we can con uh, conclude that Al-Qaeda's goals and ideology, Bin Laden's unique leadership skills, and the group's obsession with martyrdom and airliners very clearly suggests the top-down drivers of innovation were, were, were significant, were crucial, uh, really, uh, for the 9-11 uh, for attacks. Perhaps the clearest example of a bottom-up driver of innovation, as I said, was the example of uh, trial and error. Uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and his nephew Ramzi Yusuf attempts to uh, come up with a plot to detonate airliners above uh, above the sea or above uh, cities. What are we to do, however, with uh, the two processes that uh, I described as, first of all, the receptivity to proposals for terrorist attacks, and second of all, uh, the management philosophy, centralization of decision and decentralization of execution. Are these top-down drivers of innovation or are they bottom-up drivers of innovation? Well, I argue that these two particular processes actually are what I call integrative drivers of innovation because these are both processes which were dependent, uh, which were invented from the top down, essentially from Al-Qaeda's leadership. It was Al the Al-Qaeda's leadership uh, decision to be receptive to proposals, of course. And it was also uh, Bin Laden's uh, decision to centralize decision-making, but to decentralize the execution. However, uh, we cannot look at these processes as, as top-down drivers alone, because these two processes are dependent. The success of these processes is highly dependent on uh, on mid-level and low-level operatives being highly capable and, if need be, innovative in order for, uh, for these processes to actually uh, be successful. And so, receptivity to proposals for terrorist attacks and centralization of decision, centralization of execution, I would argue, um, are not, cannot be uh, categorized into a top-down or bottom-up drivers of innovation, but they're actually are, are dependent on both top-down uh, and bottom-up uh, processes in order to be successful. So what does this uh, all mean for policy? What are the implications of my findings for policy? Well, I think that first of all, this study uh, shed some light on the uh, effectiveness of, um, of terror and, uh, and insurgent uh, networks. Uh, I believe that uh, it suggests that if counterterrorism uh, agencies and, uh, and states uh, content with the uh, innovative terrorist organizations, they are uh, focusing on the terrorist leadership at their own risk. They have to look at uh, mid and lower level uh, operatives uh, where terrorist innovation can, uh, can emerge from. Uh, so my study also suggests that targeting terrorist leadership alone is not sufficient to overcome the problem of innovative terrorist groups. Counterterrorism must focus also on the middle management of the organization uh, as well. Uh, I know that I'm not alone with this uh, suggestion. This uh, basically uh, strengthens findings uh, done by uh, conduct findings by, by other recent uh, scholars uh, on the importance of focusing on the middle management. I think an additional important finding of my uh, an implication of my study is that counterterrorism policies have to start looking beyond organizations as their singular focus for counterterrorism operations. The example of uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed uh, as an independent uh, terrorist entrepreneur whose ideas basically were so significant for the 9-11 attacks to occur um, suggest that we have to look also at this uh, at, the, at the gray area between terrorist organizations. We have to look also at independent hubs of terrorist uh, uh, operations and terrorist planning such as KSM uh, in, order to, uh, in order to identify the next threat. Uh, and so in order to do that, I believe that it's particularly important that counterterrorism uh, agencies are, uh, of course, collaborating, cooperating with their international counterparts. So uh, with that, I thank you for your attention.